I definitely uh, want to thank you again for coming tonight. Intuit is a nonprofit organization, and without your help, our members, we could not have a screening just as we witnessed tonight. So I definitely encourage you to look us up. We're www.heart.org. Uh, we'll be glad to answer any questions. But if you become a member, there are plenty of benefits to that. Um, discounts in the, the gift shop, free programming. Um, and we're actually in the middle of our membership drive right now. So if you look online, you can check that out. Definitely want to go ahead and get started with Rich Cahan, who's the author of the two books about Vivian Meyer. Um, the most recent one is Eye to Eye. Yeah, it's just coming out now. Just coming out now. He'll moderate a, our panel of guests. If you want to introduce everybody, sure. make sure everybody knows who you are. Right, stand up then. Thank you. Just so everyone can see. Should we all stand up? Uh, what am I call your name? Hi, <laughs> everybody. Uh, welcome. It's a pleasure to see you. Um, it's great to celebrate Vivian Meyer in this place that is probably one of the most appropriate places in the world that the work can be shown. And uh, we have a really wonderful panel tonight. But you're all really on the panel because uh, Vivian is the people's photographer. That's what someone once said on, on, uh, um, online. And she belongs to all of us. In fact, I don't know if you know the story, but when uh, John Maloof first put the Vivian pictures online, he asked the question online. He showed about 50 pictures. And he asked the question, what would you do with these photos besides give them to you? And the first person responded within seconds, give them to an art gallery. And about one minute later, the second response came in and said, whatever you do, don't give them to an art gallery. <laughs> so uh, she belongs to all of us. And so as even though we have a panel up here who I'm going to introduce in just a moment, really I want you all to be a part of it because I think you all have the same feelings or different feelings and, and we'd like to hear what you have to say. So this is Jeff Kurz, who is the executive producer of that fine documentary. He, he lived in Milwaukee and drove down for this. This is Jeffrey Goldstein, who owns uh, every, every couple of months we, we inflate the number of pictures uh, somewhere between 16,000 and 20,000. 20,000. 20,000. This one is 20,000. Sometimes he finds more and it's underneath his bed or something. But uh, he owns uh, negatives and prints primarily. Right. And slides. And slides. And, and now and, and films. And this is Anne Zakaris who is the collection coordinator. She works with Jeff. And she and Jeff have been together since the start of this project. They archived the photos. They um, figured out what to do with the photos. And now daily, they're really in, in contact with museums all over the world, galleries and museums, uh, who are interested in showing the work. So I'm going to sit down. And um, obviously, the, the main question for, for this panel, and, and I'm not going to call on anyone's name, I, I will make this very informal, is, um, is Vivian an outside artist, and does it matter? So, I, well, I think, in, I think she sort of splits, speak, speak up a little bit. I think she splits hairs between outsider artists, uh, say something like Bill Trailer or, or Darger, um, and then mainstream, because she worked with a very sophisticated piece of equipment, so she had to go to the camera shop, she had to read books and have information. So she wasn't making artwork with <clears throat> kind of out of the mainstream type of material, and so she was very well versed with the material she was using. So I think she's actually both of those things. And it's interesting that you say this because most of the art, or a lot of the art at, at, at Intuit is painting and sculpture. Mm -hmm. There is some photography, like this exhibit that we have now. And I was just wondering to myself as I was thinking about this today, can there be or are there outsider photographers? Because um, photography in a sense belongs to us. 99% of all photographers never went to school. Um, and as opposed to most uh, adult uh, sculptors, uh, painters. Um, so, so I'm wondering if, if there is such a thing as an outsider artist, uh, as a photographer. I think there was a you mentioned that yes, there is outsider photography? Yeah, there's several. Yeah. There's, there's several of them. 
we would be interested in your observations with that. Well, one of them. They don't. No, none of them look like this. They're not as she sophisticated. A, yeah, she's way more sophisticated. She's a I mean, she's a trained photographer, and she's not trying to make pictures out of handmade cameras that the or that the maker built out of cardboard. Oh, that's crazy interesting. Crazy things like that. Right. So, Bob, would you would you feel like she's not an outside outsider artist? Yeah, that's what I said. How about um, Jeff or anyone well, in the audience? What I was going to say is that you know, and, and I agree with what people are saying, but it's also the idea that she was she was self-taught. A lot of the um, even the street photographers who were really kind of revere um, had day jobs. They worked for magazines or newspapers or the fashion industry. And she was, she truly, like, she didn't have those kinds of, she had those influences, she didn't have the day job influences, her day job was the nanny. But she, she learned, you know, she, she learned her craft by herself, which I think is really pretty phenomenal. I mean, um, I'm sure that everybody in this, this room has taken a photograph at some point in their, their lives, and you know how difficult it is to take a really good photograph. So for her to have learned this by herself, I think, is really incredible. So she does really kind of straddle both those worlds, but she was really kind of self-taught. Yes? Who took the pictures of her? And they're very sophisticated. So did she tell somebody to take the pictures in the shadows and all those kinds of things? Many of the pictures that she, the self-portraits, um, most of them she took herself. Either they were reflections, or she put a camera down and turned the camera towards towards her. You know, the, the, I, I hate to use the word selfies, but she was maybe the mother of all selfies. Uh, but some pictures were taken by people that she, uh, uh, the kids, and actually one of the uh, Inger, who was in the movie, um, here's her. I don't think this is a movie, so it's kind of a fun story. Um, she was watching the CBS News in 2012. And uh, they had a picture on the screen of a Roloflex in someone's lap. And uh, the moderator said, and next, the nanny photographer. Well, Inger knew exactly who that nanny photographer was. And she very, very clearly remembers that um, uh, Vivian, and she's, she was uh, her charge from age five to about 10. And she would give Inger the camera, the Roloflex, very heavy, sophisticated camera. She instructed her many times and told her not to shake it, to make sure it's parallel. And she, I think she still has nightmares over the worries. <laughs> and there's a beautiful picture in the book that she took and Vivian's head is cut off. So, so you're all photographers, correct? Anyone not a photographer? Anyone? That, okay. You, you haven't taken any pictures? Okay, and how many of you as photographers have ever shown your pictures to anyone besides your family and your next door neighbors? I kind think of, it's different now because we have like social media. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. But happens, you know, people are always asking the question, why didn't she show her work? And um, there are many answers to that. We don't know the true answer, but I would I would say that of the Six billion people in the world, five billion are photographers, and, and, and all but a few of them have never shown their work to anyone. So, so she was in the norm. Now you take that five billion group of photographers and someone is gonna be really, really great, and all of us are gonna be pretty bad. But I think that, that I mean, it, it's kind of the nature of photography. But, but I, I will say this, <clears throat> other photographers here had some type of intention when they were shooting, whether it was a family trip <clears throat> or family portraits, and the idea, even if you're just sharing with the immediacy of your family, you, you had an intention and a mission to, to do these works. She really had no intention, or there seems to be not a, a long-term intention of what she was doing. So I think a lot of outside artists have this obsessive compulsive behavior and it's, it's more of a self-fulfilling act. And I think in that sense, she fulfills that because as far as we know, there's no evidence or information that she had the strive to do something with this body of work. In fact, that's why it's, it's really unusual because as an artist's body's, a body work is completely unedited. It, it's in its entirety. One of you guys said that, that you were doing it for you. You were doing, you were pointing it out for yourself. She wasn't doing it for us. It was important. It's important. We're doing this and for you. For you. <laughs> and this is for you. And that's why we take pictures. We, some of us take selfies way too much because it's you know for other reasons. But 
the pictures I take, and I take a lot of pictures. I don't share them all. I share a lot of them, but it's because it's important to me. I don't. You might not think that that table of chips that I took a picture of is that special, but that moment right now is kind of like something I want to remember. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to remember all of those moments. She she was like a photo and, journalist and encapsulated was, those things. Keeping a diary, like mm -hmm. you guys said in the, in the movie, she was keeping a diary, and a diary that's visual is. <clears throat> Just as beautiful as a diary that's written out in these poetic words. That yeah, not all of us have. Yeah. Not all yeah. of us have those words. Right. Some of us speak in pictures, mm -hmm. and that's a beautiful. I'm so inspired by that. So yeah. Thank you, guys. You know, I have to also um, thank you for you know for, for bringing that up. I should also, I mean, for, for me, you have to put her in the context of of the period that she lived in in the the 50s and 60s. She was a, a single woman. Um, and, and a woman and uh, uh, working as a nanny. So chances are she maybe didn't know people who she could show her photography to. Photography wasn't considered the art form that it is now. And even if she had shown them to people, um, her, you know, her employers, the, the neighbors, I think they would have been like, that's really nice, Vivian, now, like, go take care of the kids. Yeah, yeah, no, she didn't really have. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. right. Just like, well, you know, she didn't really Light for herself. She right. just did, was like not appalled. I was like, ah. oh yeah, it's a wonderful yeah. And, yeah. and even if she were to like present her photographs to a gallery owner or a newspaper editor, I mean, I'm sure her delivery would have been a little bit off. And back to the whole outsider concept, like no, not many outsider artists label themselves as an outsider artist. Like we label them as outsider artists. A lot of times, there's like a psychological deficiency going on. We can't say that for sure about Vivian, but it tends to be a common trait among outsider artists. They have compulsions to, you know, photograph what they photograph. What? Well, a lot, a yes. lot of the outsider artists that we champion never thought of themselves as artists. It was an incredibly personal thing they were doing. Absolutely. Something they had to do. Let's, let's go back to 1955. It's January 2nd, 1955. And uh, you live next door to Vivian Meyer. It's actually 1956 because she's moved into Highland Park. And, um, and she takes out uh, a contact sheet of her negatives. And of course, it depends what contact sheet. But let's say it's a contact sheet that has the tomatoes in the kitchen and maybe the kids playing baseball. What are the chances do you think that you would have thought there was something special there? Yeah. I, I was going about being a woman and being an artist and that, you know, uh, I don't think that she would have the temerity to go up to somebody at that period of time to say, I am an artist, and, and a person who, you know, is looking at other people's lives as material in some way to maybe possibly portray herself into it. And I think that I don't, I can't even see a world where she would have unless she was encountering somebody that really gave her, you know, a feedback of some kind that she never really wanted. Right. right. And to, at, to, it, to it, try to portray right. herself as something. At the time, too, there were, there were so few photo galleries even in existence. Yes. As far as the opportunity of showing anywhere, it was, was pretty negligible. Right. My question to, the, to, to all of us, really, is do you think that we've caught up with Vivian in her aesthetic eye? You know, or do you think that, I mean, do you think that she would have been appreciated if she would have shown a contact sheet, yeah. 10 contact sheets? What yeah, do you her, think? Her formal uh, skills were fabulous, you know, her composition and everything. Right. Right. I'm really curious about the one she chose to get printed. Right. Like, you, like, you guys as the curators probably have, do you, like, see any specific themes or, like, that come up in the one she chose? Because, I mean, now we all, digital, we can see them anytime, right. but if she only saw them once, I'm really curious about the one she printed right. out, you guys or had this. printed. Yeah, the, we always yeah. feel, yeah, we always feel good when we pick an image and, and we, and yeah, there's a vintage print that goes along with it. Cause it, it, it you would think it, it meant something special to her. Um, by and large, she saw very little, you know, of what she what she shot. And there are a few vintage prints, so it's hard to like, you know, from start to finish in what Jeff's archive covers. So like make any assumptions yeah. either way. But, 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 but you bring up an interesting. Curious that one thing that you guys showed her, like the whole spectrum of like one film. Right. And right. How often does that happen? How often do you guys? 
have that? Uh, they have, they have, they're all, they're all on contact okay. strips, so you can see it. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you guys, I, I would highly recommend, if you haven't gone to the Chicago History Museum, there's an exhibit called Vivian Meyer Chicago, which is going to be closing at the end of summer, whatever that means. I guess we haven't had any summer, so. But, um, but, but at the exhibit, you will be able to see, um, besides 40 life-size pictures, has anyone been there? Along the black, kind of amoeba-shaped walls, you'll see 18 contact strips. So you'll be actually able to see that. And it's interesting that, that we've been criticized for showing that because photographers feel like our contact strips are our own magic, our own personal life, and we can't, but we did show them because we wanted everyone to understand that this wasn't a woman that just got 40 great shots because she took 100,000 of them. I mean, I've taken 100,000 shots and I don't have 40 shots, but either way, we showed them because on every strip, there are pictures that you could put in a book or an exhibit, and I've been a picture editor all my life. I've never seen anything like that. Yes? Are there um, kind of like a set of rules that you guys try to live by in regards to manipulation when you develop? Yeah, we manipulate highly. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Um, yeah. no that, that's a very good question. Great question. Yeah, yeah. So what we do, and, and Ron Gordon. Is, is Ron here? Yeah. Did he pass yeah. out? Yeah. Ron, yeah. Ron, Ron, Ron should maybe answer this. Ron yeah. is, is, is the printer of all things Vivian for, for Jeffrey. And, and I do want to preface that Ron was retired. Uh, and ready to move to New York, and he came out of retirement four years ago to be involved with this project. I was it's, just going to do one exhibit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ron is a print is a photographer's printer. So uh, we we don't crop anything. Everything is full frame, and uh, we do kind of help the negative because the negatives are even though she, her hit rate was very high, uh, on a roll of 12, she has 12 good pictures, and none are uh, bracketed. She doesn't bracket exposure. She doesn't bracket, uh, like, doing a close-up and a far away and, you know, wide angle. And, you know, it's one shot, and she sees it, and she shoots it. The only thing we do is we try to enhance the issues, because she shot before I think she had a natural sense of exposure, and but she shot before the picture would go away. And Cartier Brousseau was the same that we talked about the, the decisive moment, and uh, she was great at the decisive moment. That, that was exactly she saw what she wanted and she shot it and she moved on. So we tried to stay with that, and then we just in the and I do want to mention that we always stay first generation negative. We don't do any digital conversion or, or digital repairs. So we don't even wash the negatives. So if there's dust on the negatives and it can't be blown off, it actually gets printed. And then Sandy Stein record is the spotting and etching by hand on, on each and every print. So we, we, stick, we try to stick, stick true to the era, the technology of the era. We could have the negatives uh, worked on themselves directly, but that's, we don't think archival, that's a good thing to do. We did do one test run with Dennis Hopper's printer, uh, where he did a digital conversion with the negative. It's a beautiful image with the crimp. And did all the repairs, and then he made a silver gelatin print, a new negative with silver gelatin print. It was flawless. But that becomes second generation, and then you have more people's involvement. So we really limit all that activity. So let me translate some of this for you guys. <laughs> Um, Ron talked about bracketing. Many photographers will go out and they'll take a picture of you, a light exposure, a, what they think is a correct exposure, and a dark exposure, so that they, when they get in the dark room, they'll see which exposure was right. They'll also take many pictures of you so that they'll wait for the, that they get the right expression. Vivian took generally one picture of one person and moved on. Uh, she was remarkably skilled at composition. Um, um, Ron mentioned that, 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 we, that they don't crop the pictures. They don't really need to crop the pictures generally. There's not, there's not a lot of pictures that you go, oh, I wish that we could crop the left half or the left third of the picture, which is very, very unusual. Um, and and uh, Jeffrey talked about a digital negative. So let me explain what that is. 
what that would be is they would take the negative and they would make they would basically make another copy of the negative, but it would be perfectly exposed so that every time Ron put it into the enlarger, he wouldn't have to worry about it. And what Jeff was saying about being faithful to that generation, what he's saying is they're not correcting the negative. Every time Ron puts that negative in the enlarger, he has a lot of work to do, and every picture that he produces is slightly different. So just like when you go to a play and every night is different, every, every, every print that comes from the Jeffrey Goldstein collection is a little bit different. Yes? Were there many unexposed rolls? And were you able to salvage them? Yeah, there, there was a total between the collection, as far as I'm aware, of about 1,800 rolls of undeveloped film. <clears throat> and, and I think also there's 6,000 rolls of color that they don't know what to do with at this point. So we had 300 rolls. Uh, this is a good question. So the College of DuPage came forward and they put together a crew and they developed the roles. They were evenly fogged. They were mainly from the late 60s, early 70s. And so they were able to, it, they actually, they print very well. I mean, thanks to Ron, they yeah. print very well. Ron to put a brighter bulb in the Yeah. The Stephen, the Stephen Kasher Gallery in New York actually had an exhibition of only images that came from the undeveloped rolls of film. And, you know, they're exhibition worthy. So as a, as a give back, this Sunday we have a big show at the College of DuPage. Uh, you can see the movie again, in case you missed any parts of it. Uh, <clears throat> Rich will be giving a full talk, which you may or may not be aware of. Uh, so if, if anyone wants to come out to the College of DuPage, you're yes. more than welcome. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit, more than a little bit. Uh, away from the photography, to the question of why she didn't show her work to people. Mm -hmm. Uh, from things we've learned in the film, there's a very high probability that she had a hell of a lot of noise in her head all the time. And it was probably quite disturbing. So the sharp focus externally right. uh, probably helped to quiet that noise. I think that's true. And as I compare her, for example, with someone like Darger, mm -hmm. I think he also had a lot of noise in his head. But interestingly, his stuff, his work, uh, is much more interior. It's not as externally focused as hers is. Hers is very sharply externally focused, marvelously so. I mean, she had an extraordinary gift. But the function of this work, I'm guessing, was to keep the noise as quiet as possible. I think that it certainly was a, an important, probably a therapeutic part of her life. I think in a certain way it kept her tethered. <clears throat> yeah, with with uh, small, very small relationships. Your what? comparison, sorry. your comparison is beautiful. I think she was really trying to like pull the world in, whereas Darger was trying to get the world out of his head. Oh, that's like, interesting. What adjectives would you guys use uh, <clears throat> if there was one adjective, maybe two, to describe her work or her? What would you? What 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 comes to mind? Just shout it out. Compassionate. Compassion, okay? Lonely. Compassion. Yeah, lonely. Lonely. You don't think compassion? I don't think she was compassionate. Okay. How about that? Empathetic. What, pardon me? Empathic. I say what, okay? Empathic. Uh, empathic, okay? She's Anyone else? Intimate. Intimate. Skill. Well, it's on the picture. Voyeuristic. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Voyeuristic, yes. It's interesting um, that when we did the book and we, we interviewed about 30 or 40 people that knew Vivian Meyer, there was one adjective that kept coming up in their minds, not about her photography, but about her. And you'll never guess what that word was. Substantial. And what, and what was the context for that? The ca context was always when she was in a room, people knew she was there. Was she a big woman? Well, she was a big woman, but I think I think both physically and I think um, she had a presence. She had a presence, and uh, I don't know if you do, do you sense that presence in yes. pictures. You do. Okay. Is it clear to you that this is going to sound a little bit provocative? Maybe is it crystal clear to you that she's that she was a woman? No, that, that that woman took these photographs. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not questioning her sexual. <laughs> 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 like, supposed to be like a woman, woman, no. she's not Did the picture? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
pictures, look, if you looked at these pictures, would you say, that's a woman taking no. the picture? No. That's really interesting. Talk about her like being risky, like not being afraid, going right up to someone. At that time, taking a picture, three weeks. Okay. That's not normal. I don't even think today I would go up to someone and say, "Hey, let me see your picture." Right. I wouldn't do that. Do you feel like she reveals herself in her pictures? Do you feel like you know her? Yes. No. Okay. Is that interesting? Because these are usually one of the criteria of great art that that someone has spilled their guts out of their novel or their their art. And I, I agree with you, I don't think, uh, so what I think she's revealing is the world around her. Yes. And that's why we love this. Because it's all familiar to us. We've seen all these pictures in our lives, we just didn't take them. So you don't, the story. Well, also, the story, the story yes. yes. You don't see her in these, I see her in these. You do. And I see it as a proof of life. I'm here, I was here, and this is my journal or my diary, if you will, some of you know. But I think it's, you know, she's standing, she's in a lot of the pictures, but she's also in all of the pictures, really. Well, it's interesting because people who knew her say that she was like a, a bumper, uh, the, reflecting, she, she, was, she wanted to know all about you and tell you all about what you should do, but never talked about herself. And I see her as this giant mirror in a sweat sense going through life, and that you, in, in a lot of ways, I, I, I think it's hard to pierce through it. Uh, I know people say that we know about her through her photographs. We certainly know where she went. We certainly know a lot about her fearlessness. Somebody mentioned that. Um, but I don't know if I know. How do you guys feel about this? She's kind of like the bee. She's the bee. She's the bee. She's the bee. There's a whole series of photographs of people reacting to her, and that's that's certainly you know people either knew they were having their photograph taken or they didn't. And there's a wide range. Like children seem to really like be intrigued by her. Adults, the older you get, the more kind of annoyed they are that she's in front of them with a camera. Right. 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 Yes. Um, Someone suggested that she. Uh, you were asking the question about what uh, what uh, uh, term, what word would be right. uh, apt. Someone said empathic. Mm -hmm. If anything, I would think because of her ability to go right up into someone's face and take their picture, she was not very empathic. She was anti-empathic. Again, I think it has to do with. Uh, wanting the image, wanting, but but not. I don't think she was in tune so much with people. I well, don't think she could be. In the 1950s, photographers, a lot of especially photojournalists, started using the word "I'm making a picture" instead of "taking a picture." Do you feel like she was making pictures or <coughs> taking pictures? Very taking. Do you feel taking? Composition is so What do you mean by making? Well, well, taking is more like grabbing and moving on, which she certainly did numerically, but or is she really for that moment melding in with her subject and making it? I think a lot of people didn't know that she was taking a picture. She was an eccentric, strange woman who walked past. She could go like this and, and take a right. picture and people wouldn't know that they were being photographed. Right. And I think that's what's intriguing. I think, I think she saw things and felt things based on these people that she was walking amongst and was trying to capture. And just in that instant, it didn't feel like she had to be there to play out the whole thing. She just wanted it. That might explain the one thing. I, th I think photography is all about relationships. I think if I take a picture of you right now, we've got to form a relationship within a 30th of a second, and, and then that relationship will go. I think if I walk and take a picture of that chair after this, after this talk, I have a relationship with the chair. Now, it's a one-way relationship, but I think that that's what photography is all about, and I think a lot of her pictures are about these relationships that are sometimes unseen. So she's having a relationship with somebody, but they're not having a relationship. They're oftentimes seen. In fact, the new book has, has all pictures of people who absolutely look right back at her and, and kind of looks at the whole myth that she's this clandestine photographer in the shadows, and, and she was at times, but at times she was absolutely 
a part of the scene, which seems incredible for but anyone. It's especially, it's I think there's a thing, and you bring up a good point of uh, you know this this noise in her head, and I think she she looked through the camera for a certain sense of harmony in life, which I don't think she got in their, her day to day relationships. And you mentioned, I think, uh, you know, the beauty of her compositions, which strike me as one of the strongest elements. Yeah. So I think innately, she created these these incredible, and they're classic, I mean, painters use them, classic compositions. So she elevated the very ordinary, which could have been a chair or a pair of gloves, into the extraordinary. So the, the ordinary we all see, but she was able, able to elevate that into something of a higher thought. So I think she felt a sense of harmony uh, through ca the capturing and, and compositions and yeah, framing you know, of these images. Even though, you know, I've learned that you guys, you know, she's like one hit or however you describe that. Mm -hmm. To me, they, they, don't, they don't seem spontaneous at all because the formal quality is like, you know, like almost like Ansel Adams or something to me where, well, that's, where they seem so, even though, you know, I'm told it's like at this moment, it seems like she was in total control. Yeah. But, but on know? the other hand, but on the other hand, she got on the Chicago Northwestern train for Wilmette and went downtown and, and had no idea who was right, going to stand right. in front But of her somehow center. that moment, right. I, 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 It has the formality of right. Ansel Adams' mouth, <coughs> but, it, but it couldn't have because the spot in that made. next moment, the <coughs> horse was going to move yeah. out of the that scene. Yeah, I think that was her genius. Yeah. 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 yeah, and that's where I feel, that's what I feel like when you ask, like, do, how does she reveal herself? That's the thing that's strongest to me is somehow, I don't know how to describe it necessarily, but right. that control in that moment, you know, whether she's taking or making, it's, you know, it's pretty... Let me ask you a question. Yeah, we're, we're, oh, we're out of time. Last oh, question. Okay, okay. So. Let me ask you this really a, a strange question. Everybody here likes Vivian, right? Mm -hmm. And the whole world generally likes Vivian. Does that tarnish... What do you mean like Vivian? Just they, 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 they like the art. They, they, it's, it's, it's artistic and beautiful. Yeah, I'm sorry. Work with us. Art, artistic and beautiful. All right. So if most everybody, but Stephen Dater will say, likes Vivian, does that make her less of an artist? No. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Because usually artists are make you think and make you upset and make you. I mean, that's kind of the kind of the rule of artistry is their goosiness and so we don't feel that comfortable but if sh if everyone likes her uh, yes never met her. So does having this like background story about her being sort of like a dark inward person who like could get upset and like really like put her in children and that kind of thing sort of suit that that, that's interesting. Does that bother you? You you you've all seen the John Malouf movie, and it's referred to here. Does that bother anybody? What? Does that make the fact that she was a grumpy, uh, difficult person? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I wonder if she was trying to make some sort of statement about the class system, because she worked in this this wealthy environment. And we've heard that in that environment, sometimes she was grumpy. Right. She didn't want to tell any of those people about herself. Herself. Right. And then when she had the opportunity, she went to the, some of the poorest areas close by right. and did photos there. So is she making some sort of commentary about that in the larger? She talked a lot about class. It was very important for her to teach the boys in Highland Park to get on the L and see the wash on the line. And uh, that was important for her. I, I, I do want to mention before you wrap up that we we, we have a, a, a working space up in Rogers Park, a dedicated a Vivian Meyer office space that we work out of. It's great. There's four of us. And everybody here is invited to come up. We're easy to get in contact with via the site. Um, and you can come up and see the inner workings of what it is that we do with the project. It's really worthwhile. Where is that? It's up by, by Howard and Wester in Chicago. You yeah. talk to Jeff. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Just one last oh, question. Yeah. This is kind of goes along with her state of mind and everything else. How did she archive her film and her prints? Did yeah. she do that professionally as much as she No, and that, that's a great question. But the thing is, the material went through a series of hands. And what came, it came out of storage lockers, which meant it was moved. It went out of a truck by RPN Auction House, taken off a truck, probably handled by workers there. 
dispersed over a series of auctions. Different people handled it after. So you don't know how she actually handled it? No, so that we don't know. But, but the material, what took so long is uh, most of the rolls are in our uh, glassine sleeves with dates. And so, no, no, that you weren't No, but oh. when we got the material, but it was, it was, but, yeah, it was, right. it was all pell mell. So we, Ann and I spent about a year, year and a half just organizing. And this is, you know. So she didn't organize the catalog. Not a I, I think she may have had it organized, but again, it went through so many hands, even if she uh, had, it was inevitable. And so the collection is really split yeah. among the, the collection. And I will tell this interesting story that I know we're out of time. Um, I was just up in Toronto and I had a fellow come in from Montreal who just four weeks ago was going out, was having dinner with a friend, uh, a woman who's a photographer, and she brought a couple of Vivian Meyer books. And so she said, you got to see this photographer, she's great. And so Hugo was looking at the books and he's thinking, Vivian Meyer, like, I, I know the name. And then he starts remembering and his finds, I, I wrote her name down. And he can't remember quite why or where. He collects home movies. He and his wife went home drunk at 12 o'clock. They went through thousands of the home movies that he collects. He has 60 Vivian Meyer home movies. Oh, wow. he, he bought them in 2008, February 2008, from two different buyers or two different sellers on eBay. One box of 50 is all eight millimeter. So we don't know if she shot an equal amount of 16 millimeter, which means somebody else out there has 16. So I, I viewed just three of the films on um, <clears throat> Hugo's phone. So one is with uh, Mayor Daly at St. Pat's uh, Parade, and he's closer than you and I are. Uh, Grand Park, you know, during the riots, but not as the riots were unfolding. And then there's a view of the uh, strawberry field, uh, and one of the kids picks up the camera and actually shoots her. So you see Vivian Meyer in the film. Wow. So these are, and the quality is, is, is great. So here's 60 films. Along with Hugo, we had dinner with a woman named Maureen who has 30 negatives that she bought off of eBay years ago, Vivian Meyer negatives, before Vivian Meyer had even been known the name. And she was borrowing money to buy these negatives because she, she's the most Vivian Meyer-esque person I've yet to meet. And her story's beautiful, but she just, it was like um, Close Encounter of the Third Kind. She just couldn't stop herself from getting these things. So the story continues. So, so there's more. Thank you.